Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from Zatarans, maker of New Orleans pantry staples like Creole mustard, fish fry, and jambalaya mix since 1889. Recipes and more at zatarans.com. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. Since 2015, Louisiana Eats has called the Southern Food and Beverage Museum home. Now in its 11th year, the museum showcases culinary highlights of 16 Southern states. But SoFab, as it's affectionately referred to, is so much more than a museum. It's an active part of New Orleans' food and beverage world, with a state-of-the-art kitchen where cooking classes are regularly held and budding entrepreneurs try their hand at starting new food businesses. Liz Williams, the visionary founder of SoFab, stepped down as president earlier this year to work on big-picture projects. So on this week's Louisiana Eats, we'll introduce you to SoFab's new president and CEO, Brent Rosen. Wait till you hear what delicious things he has up his sleeve. Camellia Beans has a permanent exhibit in the museum showcasing everyone's favorite bean, the red bean. Camellia's president and CEO Vince Hayward gives us a personal tour of the interactive exhibit. And then we'll meet Ica Crawford, the recipient of this year's Paul McElhenney grant who's always cooking up something good in the kitchen right outside our studio's door. We're introducing you to new friends who also call SoFab home on this week's Louisiana Eats. My name is Brent Rosen, and I am the president and CEO of the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. The National Food and Beverage Foundation, more commonly known as the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, has been around for over a decade, focusing on food, drink, and related culture in America and the world. Founder Liz Williams helmed the nonprofit from the beginning and cut the ribbon on the museum's current home on Aretha Castle Haley, where our studio's located today. In February, Liz announced that she would be stepping down in her role as president to turn her attention to big picture projects. After a thorough national search, a new president was found, former treasurer of the NatFab board, Brent Rosen. Brent stopped by our SoFab studio to talk about his new position and plans for the organization's future. Brent, congratulations. Welcome to Louisiana Eats, and, and thanks for having us. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad to finally be on the show. I know that it gets recorded in, in your radio room fairly regularly, and now I'm finally behind the mic and, and getting to visit with you here. It's fantastic. Well, for people in New Orleans who haven't had the good fortune to meet you previously, tell us a little bit about where you come from and how you happen to come here. Well, I've, I have, even though I'm not very, I'm 36 years old, I have had a number of careers, and, and this is kind of my third. But I, I got started as a lawyer and lobbyist, and, and I did lobbying work for most of the 2000s and into the, the early 2010s, and went to law school and, and was living in Alabama doing uh, state house lobbying and, and working for Baker Donaldson. And then my wife had an opportunity to take over uh, John Besh's foundation. And she called and said, I've got this job offer in New Orleans. What do you think? And she and I had met at Tulane, and we loved New Orleans. We said, you know what? Why not? Let's go back. And so suddenly I stopped being a lawyer because I was not going to take the Louisiana bar and sort of start a career over again. And so I had been working in food business since I moved to New Orleans in 2015. Uh, I'd worked with Hoffman Media, which makes Louisiana cooking and Bake from Scratch and Taste of the South, really great magazines. And that was a, a wonderful introduction to a lot of the food businesses and the chefs and, and the different real kind of culture bearers of Louisiana. 
And following that, I did some consulting on restaurants and some other kind of food business work. And then Liz Williams, who is the founder of the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, had been a mentor of mine for a long time. And she called sort of out of the blue and said, I'm looking to take a a less active role at the museum, and I think you'd be a good candidate to replace me. What do you think? And after a visit to the museum and a a couple of days of of talking and thinking, I just said, you know, what what a fun move this would be. So now I'm kind of into career three as a, a nonprofit <laughs> professional, and I'm having a great time with it. When was your first involvement with the Southern Food and Beverage Museum? Uh, the first time, actually, um, it was, again, when my wife was the marketing director for Mountain Valley Spring and Sparkling Water. Oh. She sat on the board of the Southern Food and Beverage Museum and represented the interests of the state of Arkansas. And it was a, a wonderful experience for her. And at that time, the museum did its board meetings on the road. And they would go to different board members' towns. And Caroline, even though it was her first couple months on the board, said, we've got to get these people to Montgomery, Alabama, and see all of our food history. Because there's an amazing amount of history in Montgomery. And the food culture is, is quite interesting with the different meat and threes and places where Martin Luther King ate. And there's just a lot of neat stuff there. And so Liz said, sure, why not? So she brought the, the board meeting to Montgomery and, and people that are still on our board, like Sheila Cry and uh, Julia Johnston and just some wonderful folks. Dickie Brennan came <laughs> and it was we just had such a good time and we got to play host to all of these luminaries in the food world when we were in our 20s. Um, and it was just so exciting for us. So it was it was almost sort of like um, feels a little faded, really, over the last kind of 10, 15 years of our lives have kind of dovetailed with the 10 years of of SoFab's sort of start and then growth, and and now it's it's real flowering. So it's amazing to have been involved like this and to now come in and and know the people and know the place and know what's so great about it makes my job a lot easier rather than coming in, you know, cold off the street and not even knowing, you know, much about the museum and what it does. Yeah, that was quite a an amazing twist of fate that you and Liz were able to work this out. So explain to us what entails being the president. It's it's a my job is really to support the people who work here with us and our staff. And and I look at what we have as a platform where we are a museum and we have a collection and we have the usual museum-y stuff, but we can do so much more because of our, our size and our recognition and our communications teams and our ability to fundraise and take donations. So I try to think about what we have is, is we have a program. You know, one of the programs I'm very excited about is our meat science department with Dan Robert. And he is teaching people every other Sunday how to make boudin and head cheese and sausages and doing all of this amazing meat curing right here at the museum. And so my job is to make sure that he has the tools he needs and we're advertising his classes, we're bringing people in to come and experience it. And, and in the museum, we probably have twice as many, if not three times as many people come to take a class than we do general admittees. Isn't that amazing? And, and so when, if you think about us, we, while we're a museum, we're really more of a community center. Yeah. And, and we're a place where interested food people can come, they can learn some history, they can take a class learn, you know, how to cook a a Creole dish, a Cajun dish. We do an amazing Creole Italian class where we make red gravy. And and so as the director, it's my job to make sure that our kitchen team has the supplies they need. If we need a sponsor in order to expand our our kitchen program, I'll go out and find that sponsor so we can do seafood or we can do chicken when right now we're only doing, let's say, a pork thing because that's who the sponsorships are from. Uh So to me, it's really fun. It's like putting a puzzle together all day, every day, and, and knowing our team makes it easy for me because I, I, I think very highly of everybody that works here. And we have a great group with Jill doing what she does in the kitchen, Dan, who I mentioned, and then Liz, you know, is a wonderful... Liz hasn't is, gone and anywhere. And Liz hasn't gone anywhere. And, and so she's here to be, you know, partly a support system for me and for the team as we transition. But her knowledge and wisdom is is just irreplaceable. And, you know, I, I, I talk with her probably an hour or more a day in total, Every day. What just, a great job benefit. It is. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's to, have, to have a person like that around and, and to be able to say, oh, we did try something like that. We d- it didn't work, but we think it was this. And, and we're able to work things through and, and talk and, and really set ourselves up to where we can be successful. In this great, enormous, expansive place, I don't even know what the count must be of number of objects 
Is there anything here in the museum that you visit time and time again? Do you have a favorite little nook someplace? You know, that's a that's a funny question because I'm I'm right now putting together like a ten can't miss artifact little sheet, so that when people come to the museum, they always ask what's can't miss, and and I really want to be able to say don't leave here until you've seen you know these ten things. The ones that really jump out though at the top of my mind, we have an amazing collection of uh, Leah Chase's old sort of chef jackets and memorabilia and some art that's amazing. I stopped through there a good bit. I love our absinthe bar setup, which is another, we probably have the largest collection of absinthe material anywhere outside of France. The Copeland's exhibit, we have one of uh, Al Sr.'s fire suits and helmets from when he used to race boats. And it's got all of the patches and stickers, and, and it's just an amazing and in our Popeye section there. And we have the original floor of the shed barbecue that burned down. That is the most unusual I, thing. I've quite never an, quite understood and, that. And, and, you know, and I, I didn't, until I came <laughs> here, I always just thought it was a stage because we use it as a stage and we have our announcements when we have events and we put bands up there. But it was when the shed burned down, the floor remained and they didn't know what to do with it. And somehow someone said, what if you gave it to the Southern Food and Beverage Museum? <laughs> so we actually can – you can walk around on the floor of the shed, and it's part of our Mississippi exhibit. And those are, those are really my, my favorites. And then there's one other that I have to mention. We have an old photo of Dwight Eisenhower grilling chicken on the back porch of the White House. Oh. And it comes with the barbecue sauce he used recipe. And it's another – I tell people all the time that you can come here – and glance at things and say, wow, they've got a lot of stuff. It's not until you really get close to the exhibits that you realize how interesting almost all of the things are. From a distance, it can look a little bit like a, a hodgepodge, but it's because it's, there's just so much that we've been able to squeeze in that you, you get a lot of history here. And things like Eisenhower making chicken is just, it's amazing. <laughs> That's delicious. Brent, you must have some amazing big picture dreams. W what are they? One of the things I'm really interested in is is thinking through what would Southern food and beverage contemporary look like. In the same way that you go to an art museum, they generally have a, a history of art museum and then they have a contemporary museum where you sort of have the Renaissance in one building and the, the street art and all of that in the other. And I think it would be very neat for us to have some kind of contemporary space to go along with our history museum where we can do a little bit more current issue type stuff have some more rotating gallery space and, and be able to really focus on what's, what's new and exciting while we also then, you know, have our permanent collection, all of the wonderful historical artifacts from, from Southern food from over the years. That's, that's a real dream. And then to get more active with some dinners that we can do using our archive. We have an unbelievable archive of menus and papers and different things. And I think it would be terrific to do a, a history dinner where we could pull out some menus from the 1930s and cook to sort of the old, you know, standards to explore that. I think that would just be a, a great experience for, for our guests, and it would be fun for us to do. Brent, for you to just be able to dovetail in with such a clear understanding of the vision and the culture here, you're quite an asset, and I'm so tickled for the entire universe that, oh, thank that, that you so cares much. about and, and the things that we love. And, you you're, know? and you're extremely kind, but it, it's, it's great to be in this, this culture-bearing institution. And, and I love that term because it's our job to remember the culture and it's our job to keep it alive. And so to have a museum that's dedicated to food in that way and to now be here at this museum able to, to really carry that on and bring it to more people, it's just, it, it, I get up every day excited. That was Brent Rosen, President and CEO of the National Food and Beverage Foundation. Coming up next, we talk with our old friend Chris McMillan, co-founder of the Museum of the American Cocktail, a division of NatFab. He shares the history of the cocktail in New Orleans hotel bars when Louisiana Eats returns. I'm 
Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and from Ralph Brennan's Redfish Grill, home of the award-winning barbecue oyster poor boy and nine varieties of fresh gulf fish caught and served daily. Lunch, dinner, and private events at 115 Bourbon Street in the French Quarter. For over two centuries, the cocktail has been influential in many aspects of American life. The Museum of the American Cocktail, located inside of SoFab, celebrates the history and evolution of the high-proof drink. The museum's dedicated area is loaded with cocktail and bar memorabilia and antique accoutrements. New Orleans bartender and cocktail historian Chris McMillan is one of the founders of the museum. We sat down with him to discuss one of his favorite topics of research, the history of hotel bars in the city of New Orleans. Well, you know, New Orleans, you have to understand the role that New Orleans played in the first half of the 19th century in America. It was second only to Manhattan for its economic importance because of the Mississippi River, it's the reason why we're here, you know, it was the trade route and distribution route for goods and services into the interior of the United States from Louisiana all the way to Canada. By the 1830s, New Orleans had become so important economically that we had actually tripled our population from 1830 to 1840. We went from 30,000 to 100,000 in 10 years. And we had a transient population of 40,000 people a year, people who came here seasonally uh, to do business after the harvest had come in, uh, the cotton crop, the sugar crop. You know, uh, they came in to trade, uh, to buy, to sell, uh, to make their fortune and get rich. Well, when you have 40,000 people a year coming, they have to have a place to stay. You know, in order for a growing nation to have a growing commerce, you not only have to have a business infrastructure, a transportation infrastructure, but you have to have an accommodation infrastructure. And so it needed a new kind of dwelling uh, based on the vast numbers of people that we had to accommodate. The first hotel in America, or what we consider hotels today, uh, was uh, built in Boston, and it was called the Tremont House. And it was quickly followed by uh, the Astor in New York. Within the same five-year period, the, they built the St. Charles Hotel in New Orleans, which is on the place where Place St. Charles is located today. And it was uh, such a fantastic uh, structure. Uh, they would accommodate as many as 700 guests uh, sleeping there at any given time. What well, year is this that we're talking 1836, about? 1836, 1837. Well, in New Orleans, as you know, uh, we had a, a very competitive cultures within our city. Uh, the cultures, in fact, were so competitive that uh, within this same period, uh, we developed the municipalities mm -hmm. that we actually, you know, separate our government, our city government, uh, based on uh, ethnicity and uh, cultural backgrounds. So the French, uh, who lived in what today we call the French Quarter, had missed the opportunity to build the St. Charles Hotel uh, in uh, the Mar what we call the Maroney District today. And they lost uh, their economic significance as the center of trade and commerce in, the Nor in New Orleans as a consequence of that. But immediately after opening the St. Charles, the French Creole population opened the St. Louis, which is on the site of the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. But you have within these great hotels vast bar rooms that remember these are all male institutions for the most part the bars themselves the bar at the st charles was on the ground floor and was set at the busiest hour to accommodate 800 men and after they had finished the day's commerce which in the daytime uh, these places were called exchanges and they were essentially auction houses the slave auctions would actually happen within the bars themselves uh, the commodities auctions cotton uh, sugar uh, would happen within the bars themselves and then at night after commerce was done all of these transient 
naked men would gather in these bars. And this is when bartending as we know it really comes into existence. And, you know, descriptions as early as the 1830s and 1840s describe bartenders as we would recognize them today in white jackets with uh, shakers uh, uh, mixing drinks uh, together uh, with uh, with ice uh, and making cold drinks. And, and so really out of a, you know, desire to please our guest, which is the fundamental tenet of hospitality, you know, uh, the bartenders became more and more polished. And this is where, you know, drinking as we know it today comes into play. So we've got the St. Charles and we've got the St. Louis. What other hotels figure into this tale? Get well, us- you, you know, one of the consequences of the Civil War, you know, the economic preeminence of New Orleans was destined to end, uh, regardless of the war. And that was because of railroads. Railroads could go places that boats could not. And New Orleans missed the boat, so to speak, with with railroads. But one of the unforeseen consequences of railroads is they allowed discretionary travel. You could be in New York in January when it was 20 degrees and sleeting, or worse, snowing, get on the train, and two days later be in sunny New Orleans, and it'd be sunny and just absolutely, (laughs) absolutely lovely. And so, you know, in a devastated post-Civil War economy, our city fathers uh, envisaged a new economic model for the city and started marketing it as a tourist destination and winter resort. And as momentum gained uh, in the travel industry, we again had another explosion in necessity for accommodations. So by the 1880s, uh, you see uh, businessmen like Theodore Grunewald, uh, Antonio Monteleon create vast uh, hotels for the traveling businessman. And the fascinating part for me, you know, was to discover that, you know, this economic model that was established in the 1880s is the same one that we're operating under today, you know, 130 years later. So by the 1880s, were ladies in the bar room? No. Uh, prohibition is the seminal moment uh, for women to be allowed in bars. Now, in New Orleans, we had a unique cultural uh, tradition in that we allowed ladies in bars on Mardi Gras Day. Okay. And ladies were allowed to patronize the Ramus Bar on Mardi Gras Day. And in fact, uh, by 1900, the Ramus Bar had become so famous and the demand so great that they actually created a ladies' side room so that women could come but not be at the main bar to uh, disturb the sanctity of the uh, all bail. <laughs> <laughs> the all bail. And the Sazerac Bar had a similar uh, similar policy. And the rest of the year, you would actually come up with your chosen companion and pull up in front of the bar in your carriage, and the gentleman would walk into the bar, uh, get a Ramus Gin Fizz, and then bring it back out to the carriage and take it home with you. But, oh, it was the origin of the Go Cup? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but before Prohibition, women who patronized bars were seen to be of less than sterling character. Uh, after prohibition, really because of prohibition, prohibition brings women into bars and it becomes publicly socially acceptable for women to patronize bars. And so after prohibition, uh, we see women welcomed uh, into bars. Uh, in 1949, uh, uh, actually before 1949, uh, the Sazerac Bar moves from what had been uh, the Ramus Bar. The most famous bar in New Orleans in the 1850s was called the Jewel of the South. And it was opposite the Gravier Street entrance of the St. Charles Hotel. And the bartender there and proprietor's name was Joseph Santini. And he had run the bar at the St. Louis in the 1830s and is credited with the invention of the Brandy Crusta, which belongs to a class of drinks uh, called by Gary Regan, the great cocktail writer New Orleans Sours, uh, which are the first drinks to use an orange-flavored liqueur, triple sec, Cointreau, Grand Marnier, Curacao, as the sweetening agent in a drink as opposed to using sugar. And so the Brandy Crusta evolves, for instance, into the sidecar, 
which evolves into the margarita, and today's iteration would be the Cosmopolitan. It's mm -hmm. the same basic formula. He's also credited with inventing the Pousse Café. So when Santini dies, he owns the whole block. Henry Ramos in the 1880 comes and buys the corner leases, the corner of Gravier and Carondelet, which was catty corner to the Cotton Exchange, and opens the Imperial Cabinet Saloon. And that bar is there until 1907. And in 1907, he moves into the Stag Bar. But this had been the former location of Santini's bar. Well, in 1933, when Prohibition is over, the Sazerac Bar moves from where it had been on Royal Street to the former Ramus location where the Imperial Cabinet was located. So you have in this one location at the corner of Gravier and Carondelet, you had Santini, you had Ramus, and you have the Sazerac, the three pillars, if you will, of New Orleans cocktail culture all occupy this same physical location over a 75-year period. What a great story that is. Chris, you are one of the most fascinating people that I have ever met, and I feel so lucky to have had this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Now, what I know all of our Louisiana Eats listeners would like to know is about your involvement with the Museum of the American Cocktail and how they can come see you. Well, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have them. We're uh, located in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Uh, we've got a fantastic exhibit there uh, uh, detailing the history and evolution of the American cocktail, uh, the Sazerac, uh, the Ramus Gin Fizz, uh, the Mint Julep, uh, the Absinthe Suisses. Uh, you know, that's one of the unique things about our city is uh, we have a number of drinks that are uniquely associated with our city in a way that no other city uh, shares. New Orleans and cocktails uh, go together. Uh, you know, it's my belief that... Uh, Life in New Orleans was uncertain uh, between uh, yellow fever, uh, rogues, scoundrels, uh, rapscallions, and hurricanes. Uh, we didn't know if we were going to be here tomorrow. And so we had to uh, embrace life. And I think that this accounts for the uh, unique joie de vivre uh, that we have here uh, in New Orleans, our uh, unique embrace uh, in today and in celebration uh, because uh, we had to have today because tomorrow might not come. Chris McMillan, cocktail historian extraordinaire. You can find the legendary New Orleans barman mixing drinks and sharing his knowledge at Revel in New Orleans Mid-City. Which dish is the most emblematic of New Orleans? Some might say gumbo, some etouffee, others might suggest crawfish or jambalaya, but most, like our very own jazz great Louis Armstrong would say, red beans and rice. Louis loved him so much, every letter he wrote was signed, red beans and ricely yours. When it comes to red beans, no one knows beans better than Vince Hayward, fourth-generation owner and CEO of Camellia Beans. We toured Camellia's exhibit at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum with Vince to hear his unique perspective on all things red bean. Yeah, yeah. What we've done is put together uh, an exhibit, and the idea was to uh, depict the cultural significance of the dish of red beans and rice to the city of New Orleans. It's really a something that's become synonymous with the city and, and sort of woven into the fabric of our culture. So it begins with Sawyer Hayward, your yeah. great, great, however many greats mm -hmm. grandfather, yeah. but the bean story really picks up in 1913. Yeah, so as a family, we were always in the trade of agriculture. We transported goods and products to New Orleans, to the merchants in the French market. Everything from onions to almonds to, of course, beans and, and every type of edible agriculture. 
as the family just began to put down roots over the last couple centuries, our line of business and products have kind of just slowly whittled themselves down to dried beans. So from 1913, when Lucius Hamilton Jr. starts in the food trade working for the National Biscuit Company, he finally decides to have his own business then, yes? In, in 1913, he, he went to work for the National Biscuit Company. It was where he learned the grocery business. He learned the value of branding as the retail grocery trade began to get away from things like general stores, mom and pops, and slowly we began to get to the idea of supermarkets. He decided that he would have his own brand. So when it came time to come up with a brand name, uh, one of my grandmother's favorite flowers was the camellia. At a time when horticulture really meant uh, some type of prominence or wealth, if you had money to decorate your home with nice plants and things like that, it, it, it gave a feeling or sort of a symbolic testament that, that these were products for people that really demanded the best and wanted something that was a little extra. The next part of the exhibit is just kind of a, a depiction of what beans in a grocery store would look like starting in 1927. And there's also some open barrels here with some beans that uh, provide an interactive opportunity for uh, kids or adults really to just kind of run their fingers through the beans. It's really sort of addictive. So fun. <laughs> but sadly, the fun of scooping the beans out of the barrel was something that went away with the yeah. old traditional stores. World War II was a very pivotal point in our society. It was kind of the advent of consumerism and with that, the supermarket. Certainly, it was a very pivotal part in our history, we realized that we had to get very good at packaging beans and branding beans. And it was about 1947 when we fully transitioned into package, an experience that the consumers would have if they would reach onto the shelf, pick up our package of beans, and it would make a very distinctive... There's that crinkling yeah, sound. crinkling noise. Cellophane is a plant fiber and we packaged all of our beans in a very clear, crinkly, rigid film. And it gave us a, a very distinct and unusual presence. We don't use cellophane anymore, but we, over the years we've been very careful to keep that crinkly, rigid feel, tactile part of our packaging. Well, it's just so nice to be able to look through and see the product. Well, it's true. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many discussions we've had in our office about how clear the film is. Is it clear enough? Is it, is it providing us, the consumers, a really open window into what they're buying? And um, over the years, it's also driven a, a necessity on our part to make sure that the beans in the bags are as perfect as they can be. Why do you believe we eat red beans on Monday in New Orleans? Well, first of all, it's just a fantastic tradition, right? And like all traditions, their roots are sometimes not exactly clear. Um, but the most predominant explanation has been about wash day. And traditionally, the lady of the house did the wash, the cleaning, uh, much of the manual labor on Monday. And because beans are such a hearty food item, they can cook hours upon hours. So it made sense to cook these beans hours upon hours, freeing her up to do the rest of her work while dinner was being made. And then once she's finished and exhausted and completely kaput, there they were ready to feed the family. Maybe it's becoming a little bit outdated in modern times, but we haven't come up with a better one. The dish of red beans and rice is something that unites people across all colors, all race, all ethnicity, all income levels, you know? No matter where you live in this city, chances are you eat red beans and rice. Also, people have fond memories of red, serving red beans that their grandmother cooked or maybe to their children and things like that. So for these reasons, it's a dish that's important to us as a society and a culture, and we wanted an opportunity to celebrate that. and and the Southern Food and Beverage Museum 
just provided the perfect venue. What are your red beans like? What's the secret ingredient in the Hayward pot of red beans? Part of uh, my experience with red beans growing up is was that because it's our recipe on the back of the bag, we felt like, on the back of the package, I should say, we felt like it was important that we stick to that recipe. If we're going to tell people that this is the proper way to cook red beans, that's the way we're going to eat them. And both my parents always felt strongly about that. Growing up, that's how we made them, exactly what's on the back of the package. We used smoked ham hocks and cooked them a long time till they got real soft and creamy. And I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Do you ever get tired of red beans? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vince, thank you so much for both walking us through Red Bean City and doing your part along with your family to make sure New Orleans stays Red Bean City Central. Well, thank you, Poppy. It's been a great pleasure, and uh, you're such a treasure, and I appreciate the opportunity. Vince Hayward, owner and CEO of the L.H. Hayward Camellia Bean Company. Which southern states are showcased at SoFab and why? We'll reveal the answer to that question when we come right back. I'm Poppy Tooker. And you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from St. Tammany Parish Tourist Commission. Located 40 minutes from New Orleans' French Quarter, the North Shore's Tammany Taste features the chefs and farmers, brewers and bakers of St. Tammany Parish's culinary scene. Visit LouisianaNorthShore.com to discover more. Louisiana's North Shore, where New Orleans has come to play and get away for more than a century. Additional support for Louisiana Eats comes from Cuba Travel New Orleans, a local travel agency now offering an authentic trip to the acclaimed Havana Jazz Festival in 2020 designed to support the Cuban people through music and arts. Visit CubanNewOrleans.com or call 504-252-9774 to book your trip today. Here's this week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. Which Southern American states are showcased at SoFab and why? Among the states you'll find in the museum are, of course, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. The great barbecue states of Texas, Tennessee, and the Carolinas are represented, but you may be surprised to discover exhibits from as far west as Oklahoma and from as far north as Maryland and Washington, D.C. These states are included in what's referred to as the New South, a term created to dispel once and for all Civil War references to the Mason-Dixon line. The New South is a delicious one, and I do hope you'll stop by the Southern Food and Beverage Museum soon for a taste. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. Greetings, my name is Ika Crawford and I am the founder, executive director of Grow NOLA, a growing and food concern here in New Orleans, Louisiana. 
Our Louisiana Eats studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum are serendipitously located adjacent to the Culinary Innovation Center, an amazing state-of-the-art kitchen where often scents waft under the door that are simply irresistible and require investigation. It was on one of those forays that I stumbled across Ica Crawford, happily filling a virtual army of large mason jars. Ica is the founder of Grow Nola and is the recipient of the Paul McElhenney Grant, giving her a year-long residency in SoFab's state-of-the-art kitchen free of charge. I spoke with her in the kitchen to learn about her culinary dreams and to find out what she was cooking up. I feel like I always really love this place because I love old things. I love the china that has been eaten off of for like, you know, a hundred years. It speaks to the history of food to me. And so I naturally gravitated to the Southern Food and Beverage Museum because of that, because of all of the rare and special things that happen here. And with the rental of the kitchen, I get to make my pickles, my jams, all of the things that I do for cottage food and under a cottage food industry law. We also are starting our own pop-up pantry where people can come to the museum on Wednesdays between 4.30 and 6 and get whatever they would find in their kitchen, their pantry, like um, farm fresh eggs, figs poached in white wine, pickles for burgers, and all of the jams and jellies and such. So this is like a once a week market? Correct, we'll be here once a week, and within that we also do a food member share, which is community supported agriculture, where the individual and the farmer really get to connect in a way where we have multiple farmers that we aggregate from all within the southern Louisiana area, including our garden. The way your CSA works, the way this share works, for just $20 a week, what is it that people will get in the box? It is eight to 10 vegetables, including a fruit, a value-added product like peach jam or pickled okra or hot sauce and farm fresh eggs is twenty dollars so that it is available to all because that is what we want to bring we want to bring fresh wholesome produce and make it available to everyone you're not from new orleans i'd like you to tell us about where you're from and this curious journey that has taken you from there to the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. The 50 cent tour comes like this. I was born in Meridian, Mississippi to a single mother. She went to Southern Illinois University and obtained her degree in psychiatry. So I grew up there from like seven years old till I was a hippie somewhere on tour. And in all of that, I really came to a point where I wanted to help my space and my people and decided that this thing, which my grandmother instilled in me, the cooking, the love of food was my way. At some point I realized that I am not the top chef of the world. (laughs) But what really interested me was the taste of the vegetables, like how I could taste the difference in the peppers and like a basil picked from my garden as opposed to a basil bought from a box store. And I wanted to harness those flavors. And that's when I became interested in the journey of culinary arts and then a onto that from horticultural sciences and then the study of like plant pathogens when I started in uh, biological sciences at UNO. All of this culminated to a very simple way of pickling. I wanted people to be able to open up a jar of Creole tomatoes and taste them 
as fresh and preserved as they were the day that they were made and being able to keep up our season throughout the year. So like when the green beans come, when the blueberries come and we do big pickled green blueberries with rosemary infusions and chanterelles with garlic blossoms and the white wine jelly and finding like those one out of five vineyards in Louisiana and getting serendipity farms involved in our project and doing a white wine jelly infused with oregano blossoms. Have you developed these recipes yourself? Where does this come from? For hundreds of years, people have been developing different flavor profiles compatible to these herbs and the vegetables like the beets with infused with thyme, the pickled chanterelles with the garlic blossoms. So it's nothing new. I think it's about the actual doing of it. The actual putting and pairing them together in a very simple way that even like the most highfalutin culinarian can come and add their own flavor profiles to that pickled product, to a basic thing where somebody says, I need something right now, and they're pouring pepper jelly over a piece of hot cream cheese and stabbing some, uh, what's that, crackers? <laughs> it's, it's also beautiful and delicious. Tell me about your garden. Maybe what I want to say about our garden is that it has not only been a place of personal development, when we are doing our lasagna composting and doing mulch, compost, cardboard, and seeing the development of the soil, it's like the development of ourselves. And it's not just me, you know? That's why it's called Our Garden. When you look at the sign above it, it doesn't say Granola. It doesn't say Ica's Garden. It says Our Garden. It's supposed to give that community a sense of ownership. And they really do. Like the kids at 4 o'clock when they get off of school and, like, telling them, go and do your homework and then you can pick your carrots. Like, that makes me happy. And that's my mission is to feed people and to provide a safe space for everyone, everyone, you know? That was Ika Crawford, 2019 recipient of the Paul McElhenney Grant and our neighbor at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. I've got some big news for my KRVS friends. Margaret and Justin Gerard of the French Press Restaurant are hosting Lafayette's first ever drag queen brunch. On Saturday, November 9th, my bevy of rollicking drag queens and I will be at the French Press for four courses bottomless mimosas, and a full drag queen brunch show. Just like all Poppy's pop-up drag brunches, the event is family-friendly and will, of course, be delicious. Tickets are available at Eventbrite, and you can call the French Press for more details. That number is 337-233-9449. You can also find the details on poppytooker.com, where you can catch up on previous editions, find videos, recipes, and even order cookbooks. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Zatarans, and from Camellia Brand Beans and St. Tammany Tourist Commission. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Bourbon House. From oysters to redfish, serving fresh Gulf seafood and American whiskey on Bourbon Street. Original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to senior producer Joe Schreiner and special projects manager Reggie Morris. And to our business manager and social media maven, Maddie Mulladew. 
Come visit us anytime in our Louisiana Eats studios at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum. We're on Instagram and Facebook, too. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Toker Broadcasting.